All right, well, thank you again for being here. We, we're going to start, like I mentioned, with that bonus handout. So does everybody get a copy of that on your way in? We got a got, okay, good. So just a little bonus one I put together on um, the Olivet Discourse. And so we'll, um, we'll spend, you know, I've, I've planned probably about 20 minutes worth of talking um, about that. And then we'll take some questions at the end um, if you want to do it. Or, you know, if, if it's real urgent, you shoot your hand up and I'll see how I'm feeling. Um, <laughs> live streamers, uh, live streamers, um, I've got my phone up here again, uh, like last week. And so if you would like to text in a question, um, if, you know, we'll see how it's going in the room, but I, I'll be glad to try to tackle one of those too, um, and we'll do that. So we're going to start, we're going to get into the, the actual all that discourse. And I don't plan to do too deep of a dive on it. We want to look at it at a little bit higher level just for the sake of that's what we're doing um, in this series. Um, and just kind of give you a framework for the way I look at it and how I've interpreted these things. Um, um, we're going to start with some more foundational issues and then we'll move into the discourse itself. Um, and I'm going to pray just one more time, just a super fast one, and we're going to go. God, we just thank you again for this time. We pray that you would bless this, that you'd be our teacher. Help us to keep our eyes fixed on you. God, please help me. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So the foundational thing that I'd like to just talk about first, and I think there's some blanks and stuff on there, although I didn't put very many blanks and I mostly just kind of gave you the material so that you can <laughs> read it without too much issue. Um, but the foundational issue that I want to like start about, because this is the one I probably care about um, more, these foundational issues. Um, and the first one is this, is not to confuse the church and Israel. And, and there is a, there, there's a popular thing going in Christian circles today. Um, and it goes by different names. Uh, the most popular one is probably called replacement theology. Um, but you'll, they'll refer to the church as something that they call spiritual Israel. And the idea is, the idea is not especially complicated. The idea is, is that Israel was God's chosen people and that they rejected Christ. And so now in the church, God has a new chosen people. And so that the church, the Christians, have replaced Israel as God's chosen people. And, and at first glance, that I, my idea is, might sound like that might make some sense, but, it, but, it, but it, it's, it's bad. It's a dangerous and, it's a dangerous and wrong um, idea. And, and I think that um, there are a number of reasons why that's true. And I want to talk about that a little bit because it bears into a lot of the ways that the end times get interpreted. And as we look at the Olivet Discourse with Christ, that is going to have a heavy bearing um, in how we understand what Christ is saying. Um, and really all the way through Revelation and the prophecies of Daniel and all of that, it matters if Israel has been replaced by the church or if Israel, if the children of Abraham are still have a role to play in God's plan. Okay, so um, the... And it gets tied up with a lot of other stuff. We don't need to get into all that unless if there's questions about where this is coming from, then you can ask those. I'd be glad to try to help. But, but it's out there. It's, it's, a, it's a prevalent thing. If you read books, if you get end times books or go to conferences or watch things on YouTube, you will run into people that talk about the church as spiritual Israel. And I would just like to say to you, I, I, I think that is <laughs> a very dangerous idea. Um, we'll talk about why. Um, it ends up being important because to have the church take over from Israel, you must combine, you must, to combine them, you must allegorize many of God's promises. And we talked last Wednesday extensively about the problems with the allegorical interpretations of scripture. Once you're going to allegorize scripture, you can make those verses say literally anything you want. There's, there's no fence anymore. You can go as far as you want to go. Um, and so I'm very against allegorical interpretation for that reason. But this is actually, I would argue, even a step further. It, it's, it's bad and dangerous to allegorize the scriptures. But how much more so to take promises, like promises that God has made, and say, well, God didn't really mean that. It, 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 what, what, well, yes, God said he was going to give them the land, but what he meant was he was going to give them great blessings. You say, well, can we believe what God says or not? Yeah. Especially when it's like clear. I mean, it's not like God just said, well, I'm going to enlarge your borders or something generic. I mean, there are things like that. But God says, well, it's going to go from the sea to the river Euphrates and from in the north here down to the south in Egypt and outlines the land that he's going to give them, for example, do we believe that promise of God? Yes or no. 
And so one, if you're going to say, well, God has gotten rid of Israel and now he's going to do it through the church, is he going to give the church some geographic borders? Do we, do we think that? Like all of a sudden it all starts to spin apart. And, and again, like not only does it make it so that you cannot understand these prophecies anymore because now we're, we've cut our anchor loose as we moved into allegorical interpretation. But my concern greater than that, like if somebody can't understand the end times, like, okay, that's a bummer, but like, all right. But once we're going to start, I think, insulting the character of God, that he, his promises sound specific, but they may not actually be true the way they sounded. I don't, I, I start to bristle at that. Does that make sense? Okay, that's, that's why your pastor's worked up about this. Okay, Let's, let me give you a couple examples. So the promised land, I just mentioned Genesis 15, 18, is much more land than historic Israel ever possessed. So is God going to keep that promise of the land that he made, yes or no? Uh, number two, the promised king in 2 Samuel 7, 12, and in many other places, uh, God promises a descendant of David to sit on David's throne forever. He's, you know, forever and ever. That there's going to be, and like, pfft, where's the descendant of David on the throne? Is, is that going to come true? Will there be a king to sit David's throne and his rule that won't end? And they, well, it's a spiritual rule. Like, okay, but do you think David or any of the people that God gave those promises to thought that? And how much are we willing to take God's promises and go, well, it sounded like that, but it didn't mean that. Uh, see the promised destruction and reestablishment of the temple. Now, that one is interesting. Um, when you read about it, Micah 3, 12, and then through 4 and 2, uh, the Bible prophesies the destruction, rebuilding, and destruction again of the temple. The first half of that has already come literally true. You're in a very weird position to say the first half of this was literal, but the second half is a spiritual temple. Like, that's a weird distinction to make. Uh, and again, it cuts against the character, I think, of God. And then D, the promised national salvation and turning of Israel to Christ. That's not just something that Jesus talked about. We're going to see Jesus talk about it here in the Olivet Discourse. But that's not that Jesus didn't just think this up. The prophet Zechariah wrote about it hundreds of years before and promised that the nation in mass would receive the Messiah. So if Jesus was the Messiah, which he clearly was, is, did they nationally receive him? No, only, only, a, only a remnant did. So is the nation of Israel going to end mass turn to Christ or not? Yes, he is. And so um, the, the, big, the big concern here is that if we start to blend the church and Israel together, then now we're going to start doing great damage, uh, not only to the scriptures, but to specifically even to the promises that God has made. And I, and I think that's something we ought to be alarmed about. They say, well, Israel, Israel turned their back. They, it's, there, it's on them. They rejected God, right? And God has conditional promises. If you do this, then I will do that. And if you don't do this, then this is what's going to happen to you. But many of these promises, and specifically these ones that I've mentioned, are unconditional promises. God makes them with no ifs, ands, ors, or buts about them. He says, I, the Lord God, will do this. And so there's no wiggling out by, well, Israel you know, betrayed God, which they did, but that doesn't change God's character. Uh, Jeremiah 31 is a, is a great verse. I love this one. Um, it, it's poetic, but it's, it's powerful. Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for a light by day and the ordinances of the moon and the stars for a light by night, which divideth the sea and the waves thereof roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, in other words, if day and night stops, if the sun goes out and the moon and the stars go away, says those ordinances that I have established cease, then, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation forever. So, so God says the nation of Israel is going to stop being a nation when I turn out the sun. Right? That he connects these two as like as we expect the sun to be there, the nation of Israel is going to be there. So and in fact, Christians have, Christians have long understood this. Long before Israel became a country again, you go back to all the ancient Christian writings you want, all the ones that took the Bible literally, and they all said, well, at some point, Israel's going to have to become a country again. And look at what happened. I mean, it's really, really amazing. Um, and Bible believers have been expecting that all the way along. Romans 11.1, 1, even in the New Testament, even after the rejection of Christ, so even after his crucifixion, I mean, this is, this is a decade that Romans is being written after Christ's rejection by the nation of Israel. And in Romans 11, 1, he addresses it. And he says, I say then, hath God cast away his people? 
And what's the answer to that? God forbid. He has not cast away his people. Now, he's dealing now with the church rather than primarily through the nation of Israel, but he's not done with them yet. There's promises yet to keep. There's work yet to do with Israel. God is not finished with them. They've been kind of put to the side. And then the Bible describes the church as being an olive, a wild olive branch grafted in to the tree, the olive tree that is Israel. Okay. And Romans 11 is a very deep text. That, that one's a month of preaching in there too. But, but that's, you, you go read it. That punchline, that's, that's a fair summary of it. Okay. So the greatest problem, I'm not even done yet. <laughs> the greatest problem is not even just the blending of the church in Israel. It's that the blending of the church in Israel is often a prelude to trying to blend law and grace back together. And, and, and I see this all the time that <clears throat> I, one of the reasons I get really antsy when people start trying to say, well, the church is spiritual Israel or the two are the same thing is that often the next step is to start trying to make the laws that God gave Israel apply to his church and to start to say, well, because it's all one thing, then maybe we should be worshiping the Lord on Saturday and maybe you should not be eating that bacon. I expected a bigger boo from a Baptist church. No, I, you know, and maybe you, you know, and the hand washings and what about the festivals and, 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 and all of a sudden we start piling on all these and, and religious people love more rules. And the New Testament is just too short on rules for them. So they say, well, we're spiritual Israel. And now we can go grab all the laws and rules that God gave Israel and plonk them right down on top of Christians. And it gives, it's a way to keep people busy, I guess. So, but the Bible is filled with warnings about the mistakes of trying to combine law and grace. This is the biggest mistake that you can make. This one is easily the biggest. We're, we've, we've moved from, okay, if you don't understand the end times, okay. Maybe I don't understand the end time. Some of you will leave here and decide that that's true. So there we go. The bigger mistake that I hope that I'm very passionate about is that we not combine the church and Israel. Keep those things separate. That's important. If you don't do it, you, you're insulting, I believe, the character of God. And you have made great confusion out of the Bible. You're going to be super, super lost. And then there's the third and most serious thing is when we start to try to combine law and grace. And, and, and the Bible is exhaustive on the subject. The great news of the gospel message, when we talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel message is that you cannot earn your salvation, that it is not done by the law, it is done by grace, received by faith. That's the gospel message. And when we start blending the church into Israel, we dilute or even ruin that message. And there are people that do not understand this, that, that go to like churches that think they have to help God earn their salvation or, they, or, or, or they've just blended works in and it's a terrible, deadly mistake. Um, Jesus Christ teaches extensively on it. The New Testament teaches extensively on the subject. The entire book of Galatians deals with almost exclusively this subject. If you're confused about this at all, Galatians, go home and read it. It's not a difficult book. It's not that long. And it just takes a stick and beats the tar out of the whole idea. And I just don't know how anyone can read Galatians and, but people do. Okay. <clears throat> but here, here's a sample. Galatians 3. This is how Galatians starts. Oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ has evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only what I learn of you. Received you the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Did you get the Holy Spirit by being a good person? Is that how you did it? Or by the hearing of faith? Well, it's by faith that we got the Holy Spirit. It's by faith that we got saved. And so he says, are you so foolish? Having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? It's like dance with the one that brought you. That's, that's a very loose paraphrase. No, but, 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 but I'm just saying that like, and this is a thing that, that Christians, I think, Christians are vulnerable to this. I mean, this is written to a Christian church, the church at Galatia. It says, don't make this mistake, Galatians. It's a foolish thing to get drugged back into the laws and ordinances. Those are for Israel. They're not for the church of Jesus Christ. They're not. Okay. And so, and, and, and people, people go different places on the spectrum. I, I know Christians that think the church is spiritual Israel and they think that um, we've replaced them and that some of those things apply to us, but they've, 
but they've not fully combined law and grace. But then you've got people that are, it's, it's a mess though. My advice to you, for those of you who I'm your pastor, stay away from this with a 10-foot pole. Don't, don't go anywhere near it. Keep the church and Israel separate because they are. Good enough? Any questions about that? I believe that's the most important part of the teaching that I'm going to do on this tonight. Okay, good. Praise God. If, if you're at home and you're wondering about that or you're confused, or you, got, you want some resources to help somebody that you know that got tangled up in this, the best resource, frankly, is the book of Galatians. <laughs> but, but second to that, if you want some help, let me know. Okay, so now let's get into um, Jesus' teaching on the end times. So now I believe the whole Bible is the word of God. And so to that extent, everything in there is, is Jesus' teaching on it. Um, but Jesus, out of his own mouth... He had, the, had one big sermon. I mean, he references the end times repeatedly throughout the Gospels. But he has one sermon that he delivered that is almost entirely devoted to the end times. And so it's really fascinating to study just right directly out of the mouth of Jesus to his disciples what he had to say on the end times. And so we often call that, the, like in, in Bible hobnobby circles, uh, we call it the Olivet Discourse. And so that's your, that's your big phrase for tonight. If you want to go away, it's the Olivet Discourse. So what is the Olivet Discourse? And you've got some notes on it here. It's an extended teaching or it's a sermon that Jesus preached on the Mount of Olives about the end times. It's in Matthew 24, and it runs to the end of Matthew chapter 25. So it's two chapters. It's a two-chapter long sermon. Um, and, I, and just remember, and you all know this, I think, the chapters and verses are added later to make it easy for us to find things in our Bibles, right? Jesus didn't, as he was preaching, didn't go, okay, now verse 2. <laughs> and now we're going to begin chapter 4. Like, Jesus didn't do that, right? He delivered his messages, you know, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the disciples wrote it down. We added the chapters and verses later because otherwise it'd be very hard to find anything in our Bibles. So the break between 24 and 25 is nothing. It's th this is the message. And, and you go read your Bible, you'll see that that's, that's true. The, the, all of that discourse is recorded also in the Gospel of Mark and also in the Gospel of Luke. It's not mentioned in John. Um, but I've given you the references for it. If you want to go read the parallel passages, it's long in all of them. Um, almost all of Mark chapter 13 and almost all of, Mar of Luke chapter 21. But the Matthew one is by far the longest and the most detailed version of it. The other, the other recordings of it kind of jump forward in time. It covers the same stuff, but not as detailed as it's covered in Matthew. So Matthew is a good one to study. Now, the other thing that you need to know about the Olivet Discourse, so we call it the Olivet Discourse because it's on the Mount of Olives, or Jesus took his disciples out to the Mount of Olives and preached. Um, but it's a couple of days before Jesus is crucified. The timing of it is significant as we try to understand it. The triumphal entry has already happened. And all the Gospels put this in the exact same place. So in, in, uh, in Matthew chapter 23 or 21, Jesus comes in Palm Sunday, right? Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed be he that comes in the name of the Lord. He goes to the temple and is turned away. He is not received as Messiah by the people in charge, by the scribes and the priests and the Pharisees. They, they reject him there at the temple. This prompts Christ's pronouncement of woes upon the Pharisees, upon the leaders of the nation of Israel, and a judicial blindness onto the entire nation. I mean, it's a very sober... I mean, you have to understand that Jesus has come right as prophesied, I mean, right on time for when the da prophet Daniel said he would come. He's done all the signs that Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel said that he would do. And, and, and they have seen them. And, and we, we talked about it some last Sunday in the sermon. You know, when he raises Lazarus from the dead, right? What do they say? Oh, we, we don't believe he really did it? No. They say, if people find out about this, they're going to come take our place away. And so they choose themselves over the Messiah, clearly demonstrated in power that he's the Messiah, that he's the promised one, and they reject him. And so, so Jesus, it, it's, a, it's a sober chapter. You go read through Matthew 23, and Jesus says, Woe to you, Pharisees, you blind guides, you strain at a gnat and swallow a camel, and woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. And he just lets them have it, you know. Um, and, then it's, and then on the nation of Israel, he goes out on the Olivet. He weeps over Jerusalem, 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 thou that stonest the prophets and killest those that God has sent to thee. How I would have gathered thee as a hen gathers her chicks, but you would not, right? <clears throat> and that ends chapter 23. That's, that's exactly what's preceded this. Christ come triumphantly right on schedule, been rejected, 
pronounces woe on the blind religious leaders of Israel, and then says, the end of chapter 23, Behold, to the nation of Israel, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate, for I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth, till you shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. In other words, this is it. It's like he came in triumphantly and was rejected. The nation of Israel is not getting another shot at the Messiah until they say about Christ, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And when they're ready, because they don't want, they say, we don't want this Messiah. We want a different one. He says, you're not going to get any Messiah until you realize your mistake, until you receive me, and then you're going to get your Messiah. I'm, I'll come back. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's the context for the, all of that discourse. That then sets the platform for the teaching that then Jesus t gives his disciples beginning in chapter 24. And that context, I think, is super, super important. Now, the next question, and then we're going to look at the Olivet Discourse itself directly, but I want to answer this question. It's a little bit, I debated on if this is cart before the horse or not, but this is what I settled on. Okay. <laughs> How do we interpret this teaching? So this two chapters is a very intense sermon, um, and the the literature out there, people that have written on it throughout Christian history and today falls into three big categories. Uh, the first one is, well, we're going to take it allegorical. For the allegoricists, they pretty much say that everything in those two chapters happened already in 70 AD. You, if you ask them, when is the Great Tribulation? They say, oh, it's already happened. It ended in 70 AD. That's, that's what they believe about it. And then you say, well, when did this happen or when did that happen? They say, oh, well, it's allegorical, <laughs> right? Did it last for seven years? No, that's allegorical. It's just like, it is what it is. This view requires violent twisting of the scriptures. And so I'm not gonna spend any more time on that. Okay, so the second major camp that we find in trying to understand the Olivet Discourse is that it is literal, but it applies to the Christian era. In other words, it applies to what we would call the dispensation of grace, the age of grace, in which we now live where Jesus has set Israel to the side. He's now going to work through his churches until he undertakes to finish with Israel again. And we say, well, it applies to the Christian. These things are going to happen with Christians around. This will happen in the future to followers of Jesus. You do find there's another little bit of a camp in here that uh, C.I. Schofield, who's a great Bible scholar, he advanced this idea um, of what he called double fulfillment, <clears throat> where it's going to happen to the Christians in sort of a low-key way, and then it's going to happen again in a very intense way for Israel. So he said, you know, let's apply it to both, kind of, right? Um, and we'll come back to that in a second. Um, and then the third, the third view on it is that it is literal, but specifically to the nation of Israel, that Christ here is addressing Israel, and that's what is in view here. Yes. Not simultaneous. No, he thought, he thought, he, what did he say? He had, a, he had a great little phrase. It's um, now and not yet. So, yeah. Yeah, good question. <clears throat> um, anyway, okay. So, so the idea then is if, we're gonna, if we take it literal to the nation of Israel, then this is the future of the nation of Israel after rejecting their Messiah, which I've already kind of tipped my hand that that's my interpretation, that my, my approach to this is that Jesus has come to Israel, been rejected as their Messiah, and now he says this is what is waiting in the future for the nation of Israel. I think that is the straightforward reading of, of the text, that, that this, this is not going to happen to Christians per se. Okay, so um, why, why let, so let me give you my view in just a little bit more detail. I got a chart here. This is in the original handout, but I'll refer to it maybe if we need to. But I, I would like to say this about it. I believe that either of the literal interpretations, it's literal to the church or it's literal to the future nation of Israel, that either of those is a biblically appropriate way to look at it. Like people, people that take that view, I, I see where they get that from. There are reasons to think that. There are verses in there. Whichever of those views, literal to the Christians or literal to the nation of Israel, you're, there's a couple of sticky verses in there for either side. Does that make sense? That like... With my view, there's a couple in there that I go like, 
if it was just that verse, I think I'd change my mind. But it's not just that verse, there's a lot, right? And in their defense, the people that take the other side, that it's literal to the Christians, are in a similar boat where there's a number of pretty sticky verses in there, and they, you know, give them the benefit of the doubt, they'd come my way if it weren't for the ones that... Anyway, so it comes down to how you weigh some of it a little bit. I believe that they're both appropriately biblical, as long <laughs> as they don't try to combine the church and Israel. And, and again, I've already told you why I believe that's super important, and, and, and that will come up because the verses, for my view, that it's literal to Israel, that are, that are a little sticky, there's no danger of blending Israel and the church together in solving those difficulties. Whereas the other side that says, well, it's literal to the church, to resolve their sticky difficulties, I will often see them veer off into blending the church in Israel. And they don't do it full scale usually, but those little bits of overlapping the church in Israel make me very uncomfortable. I, I start to feel very nervous about those things, which frankly is my problem with Schofield's now and then interpretation is that, and Schofield doesn't blend the church in Israel. He's got that, he's got that straight. He's, he's right down the line on that as far as I can tell. But, but as you start to overlap those things, you just ramp up the chance that you're going to confuse people or get confused yourself. And it's just not my favorite. I don't, I don't, I don't love it. It's not, I would hesitate to say it's wrong, but I don't love it. Is that fair enough? <laughs> okay. So, um, so I believe, so let me give you four quick thoughts about why, it was, why when I look at this, I believe that the best way to read this is it's the future for the nation of Israel, that it's the literal future for the nation of Israel. Uh, first of all, trying to apply this to Christians sets up many potentially confusing points between the church and Israel. That is the overwhelming problem you'll have if you try to, if you if you read into the the people that are facing the persecution and they're dealing with the wrath of God and that are suffering during the tribulation. Because Jesus talks about the tribulation and the, the great tribulation, unless those days be shortened, no flesh should be saved. And we start to well, what do we mean by saved in that context? And and you start to run into lots of collisions between are we talking about the church? Because if it's the church saved means something really specific, right? And we understand the way that grace is applied and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and promises that God's made to the church. And, and, and those difficulties become very sharp in a hurry if we look at the people in the Olivet Discourse, Christians, it's very difficult. But if they're Israelis, if it's the Jewish people, all those difficulties go away. It becomes very plain. Um, and I would just would say again that God clearly has separate programs for the church and for Israel. Um, 1 Corinthians 10, 32 is one of my favorite examples of it in a, in a very simple verse. The Bible says, give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Those are the three categories of people as far as God's concerned that exist. And that's not the only verse that teaches that. That's extensive through, through the New Testament. But those are the three categories. You can be a Jew, you can be a Gentile, or you can be a Christian. And if you're a Jew and you get saved, guess what you are? You're a Christian. And if you're a Gentile and you get saved, guess what you are? You're a Christian. But there's still a distinction between the Jews and the Gentiles. Why? Why is it not just Christian and unchristian? Because God's not done with Israel yet. Because God has not cast his people away. Because there are promises still to fulfill to who? To the descendants of Abraham. And that's not me. I don't, I'm not related to Abraham. So none of those promises apply to me where they specifically apply to the descendants of Abraham. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so one of the reasons I prefer reading, chat, reading the Olivet Discourse as applying to the nation of Israel is it solves a whole ton of problems. It immediately gets a lot easier to read and understand what's happening. Number two, um, it's supported by Christ's declaration that Israel would not see him again until they say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. There's lots of promises about Christians and and, you know, just our, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and, you know, just that when we die, we go to be present with the Lord. And you, you just, again, you're introducing new difficulties when you say, when Jesus has said this very sharply to Israel, it makes sense in the context of the Messiah to the nation of Israel. And it gets very difficult if it's not that. Thirdly, it clarifies why the instructions are only given to those in Judea. As we look at it here in a minute, you're going to see that when Jesus says, hey, when you see the abomination of desolation, when this thing happens and that thing happens, you know, 
if you're in Judea, you need to get out to the hills. And if you're in the country, don't go back into the city. And there's all these instructions that are given to what to do in the nation of Israel when this happens. But there's no instruction, like, what do we do in Spokane? Like, you know, do I, I, mean, I already kind of live in the hills. Is that far enough? I mean, and, and, and that's easy enough to solve. You just say, well, that's the only place where it's really relevant. So God gave the instruction to anyone that happens to be living in Jerusalem. But if this is to all Christians, and, and the tribulation is clearly global in nature, why is that the only one that's addressed? Why are we not, why are the rest of us not given any instructions? And then you get people that are like, well, that's why we all need to move to Jerusalem, but that doesn't make any sense. I need to move there so I can flee there when, like, right. like what are we talking about here? Like, aren't I safer here? And it just, it, that's, not, that's not a huge thing, but, but it's a reason. Um, and, then, and then finally, um, I believe that taking this as addressing the nation of Israel lines up the best with the other scriptures that I would argue pretty clearly detail a return to the Old Testament system. So the 70th week of Daniel is, is one of the major, major keys to understanding the end times. Daniel's prophecy of the 70 weeks of God's judgment on Jerusalem. And, and Daniel is explicit that it is to make an end of iniquity to seal up the promises, to bring in everlasting righteousness and anoint the most holy. And it's about restoring Jerusalem and bringing in the Messiah. That's what the 70 weeks of judgment are for. But the 70 weeks are really fascinating because at the 69th week, according to Daniel, the Messiah is going to come and be cut off for the sake of his people. And then in the 70th week, that's when there's a false Messiah. He causes the oblations to cease in the middle of that week which is the abomination of desolations. And then Christ returns, crushes him, sets up the everlasting kingdom. So it's a weird deal. The 69th week happened in 30, basically AD. That's, that's Jesus Christ, right? So where's the 70th week? Where is it? The 70th week is picked up at some point in the future. There's a gap between the 69th and 70th week. I think I maybe have... Yeah, and so, so the sort of traditional understanding, though, and this makes the scriptures line up really, really nice once you understand, once you, once you line this up with what the Revelation says and the other prophecies have, then everything like, like snaps really cleanly into place. Where you have the age of Israel, the law, Christ comes at the first coming on Calvary, he's rejected, he dies, he starts a new thing, he describes as the mystery of the church. And the Old Testament doesn't have any prophecies about the church, they're, they're not in there. I mean... There's some shadows and types, but there's no like direct prophecies about the church. So Jesus pulls the disciples aside and extensively teaches them about this new thing he's going to do um, in the church. And so, so then we have the church age. And then at some point, now I would argue that's when the rapture happens that the church age ends. And it's a return to the Old Testament system where God's going to have the 70th week of Daniel, that final judgment to complete all those prophecies to bring an everlasting righteousness and set up the kingdom. It also fits really well with sort of the general dispensational model, which a, a literal reading of the scriptures supports a dispensational model, which just means that God has different standards that he gives humanity, and there's different judgments when people fail at those standards. Salvation is always and only through Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. amen. But, you know, of course, in ages past, they had to look forward to Christ. They didn't know his name. They knew him as the Messiah or the one that was to come or the Redeemer. Now, after Christ has come, we know his name is Jesus Christ. We can, so we look back on it. Salvation's always been that way. But in the Garden of Eden, there was no Ten Commandments. Right? It was don't eat the fruit. Right? And so when they did, they received a judgment in the fall. In the age of conscience, same thing. Still no Ten Commandments. Still no law. Right? What was it? It was, it was obey your conscience. And when you fail, there's blood sacrifices to make, looking forward to the Messiah. Of course, that was the worst period so far the world's ever seen. Ends in the global flood. It's a type of the tribulation that's going to come. After that, God puts, he says, you're going to have to help each other out. And it starts with, it starts with capital punishment. You, you can't just have these murderers running around and nobody can do anything about it. So now you're all in it together. You're going to watch out for each other. If somebody murders somebody, you're going to get together and hold them accountable. And so we call that the age of government. Of course, people immediately turn government into a tool for evil. And that's the Tower of Babel. Then you get promise. God gives Abraham. What, what laws did Abraham have? One, God told him to go live in the promised land by faith. And so what did Abraham do? Move to Egypt. I mean, it's kind of wild. And you think about all you had to do was live there by faith. 
And he's driven out by fear and worry and his descendants end up slaves in Egypt. And so God delivers him out of Egypt and he says, okay, I'm going to be clearer this time. <laughs> and then he gives him the law, right? And the law is way more extensive than just the Ten Commandments. He gives him the law. He says, do this and I'll bless you and don't and I'll curse you. And so they don't. <laughs> and so they end up conquered by the Babylonians and then conquered by, I mean, it's just like conqueror after conqueror after conqueror and the Medes and the Persians and the Greeks. And here they come now the Romans, right? And it's under this that Jesus Christ arrives and says, okay, now you can have it by faith, right? So that kicks off then the age of grace where what are the laws that we have? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The command of our age is to repent and receive Christ. Change your mind and receive Christ. That's the command today, right? And people, because they're already condemned. We're already condemned, 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 condemned by any standard you conceive of. So now we live in the age of grace. But then the tribulation comes and, it's, and all of a sudden we see people getting judged by their works and by these standards. We're going to see that. This, this is relevant. This comes in the Olivet Discourse because Jesus is going to say, hey, you goats, you did this and didn't do that and so you don't go in. And you sheep, you did do this and you did do that and so you can come in. And it's like, it's a, it's a, it's a back to an Old Testament, if you will or if you won't, system. And again, if you understand this as it's the 70th week of Daniel, the age of grace has ended. It's a return to the Old Testament system. God is again undertaking to deal with Israel, fulfill all of his promises and bring in righteousness. That all makes sense. That's y'all kind of with me. Once you start mushing things together, it gets real hairy in a real big hurry. Okay. So that's that. There's the church age. We talked about that. And again, I'll just, the only other thing I put that slide in there, I just wanted to mention about the church age is again, revelation. It's a fascinating thing. You go look at it. The word church, ecclesia is used a bunch in the first three chats. It's used, I mean, it's hundreds of times in the, your new Testament and you use the word church over and over and over church, 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 church. You get to the book of revelation. Church is used a bunch of times in the first three chapters and never again until the very last line. <laughs> where it says, grace be unto you and all the churches of God. Amen. The end. Like, that's it. And so like what, it's a weird thing <laughs> that it's churches, 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 then nothing through the whole apocalyptic scene again until the very end. So take that for what's worth. The last thing I want to say about this is, um, I got a note at the bottom of that page about Israel's 10th man. I don't know if you know this story or not. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, so Israel got blind, the nation of Israel um, after their creation, got blindsided twice by two wars that they weren't expecting. And all their experts got together and agreed that they said, well, you know, Egypt's not going to attack. Like, they, they, there's, you know, we don't think they're, they're talking about it, but they're not serious. And then, of course, they did. And then same thing with Syria. So after it happened the second time, uh, Israel passed a, uh, they have a law or it's a rule, I don't know, that if the 10 experts in the room all agree, it's the duty of the 10th man to disagree. It's his obligation to behave as if the other nine are all wrong so that they don't get into like that kind of group think sort of mindset. And so why am I talking about this? I am persuaded that the rapture is coming <laughs> and that we are, and that we are out of here before the antichrist, before the man of sin is even revealed. I think the Bible teaches that pretty clearly. The antichrist will not be revealed until the restrainer is taken out of the way. So I, I expect to be gone. Now, <clears throat> if a guy takes over Europe and starts handing out a mark that you got to pledge allegiance to him or you can't buy or sell. Or if he, they rebuild the temple and he goes in there and says, hey, I'm better than God. I want to be friends with all the people <laughs> that have been stockpiling guns and ammo and food. Um, <laughs> the, the, uh, so so just, just know that if you have a different take on this than I do, um, I think you're wrong, but I want to be your friend. Okay, fair enough. I mean, that's, that's genuinely the spirit that I have, uh, I have about this. Okay. So all of that discourse. Um, well, let me ask you any questions about that. That was a lot. That was more than I thought. I'm the only person here who's surprised. So that, that was, those are, those are my reasons. Yeah, sister. Oh, so the question was, during the tribulation, we will go back to what? Back to an Old Testament system. And what, and what I mean by that is, so like in the Old Testament, so salvation is always by Christ. That's true. 
In the New Testament, we, we live in a very unusual age because the Holy, Jesus said it's profitable that I go away, that I might send the Holy Spirit to you. And so one of the marks, one of the things that makes a Christian different than like a, uh, an Israelite in the Old Testament is that the Holy Spirit would come upon people and depart or the Holy Spirit would do some things, but the Holy Spirit wasn't like a, a presence and he wasn't an, certainly not an indwelling presence in the people of God. But Jesus, by his sacrifice and his ascension to the Father, was able to send the Holy Spirit into our hearts. And, and every Christian has the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, if you have not the Holy Spirit, you're none of his. And so, like, definitionally, what it means to be a Christian is to have the Holy Spirit. And that's a very special thing. When you read, when you read the tribulation, when you read the things that are going to happen, there is no evidence of the Holy Spirit indwelling people, they, you know, it's, all those verses, greater than he, greater is he that is in you than is he that is in the world. Like all that is like reversed. It's, it's very much like an Old Testament system where there are prophets and there's angels and there's miracles, but the Holy Spirit is not like at work convicting people. He's not indwelling people, the people of God. Does that make sense? Yes. The question was, does he still come upon people? And he for sure does. But that, but again, that's because it's noteworthy. Like when you have the two witnesses that like prophesy and do stuff in, in, in Israel, when you read about that in the, in the Revelation, you know, it's like the, the Holy Spirit comes upon them or he comes upon the 144,000 and seals them. But if it were a New Testament system, that almost doesn't make sense because we would just all have him. And so the fact that those things are noteworthy means that it's, it, it reads just like the Old Testament reads. All those things are handled in that same manner. Does that sort of make sense? Okay, that's what I mean by a return to an Old Testament system. Yeah. You were talking about the promises that he made to the people of Abraham. Right. And you said that we were not descendants of Abraham. Right. Uh, I mean, I'm not. Huh? Uh, I think we have a, I, I know that we have one, one person at church that's a little bit of a descendant of Abraham, but go ahead. So Yeah, well, so, so God's promises, so the question is about who are the descendants of Abraham, right? And, and there's a, by faith, we are the children of Abraham, meaning that we are the children of faith, right? But the promises to Abraham are to him and to his seed. And so his seed, that's, that's the genetic lineage of Abraham. And so, and, and the Bible is at great pains to trace Christ's lineage all the way down through that. And, and we, have, we have those lineages. They get tougher after the destruction of Israel of like who's in and who's out. But God doesn't have any problem understanding that. The Jews have their rules for who counts as a Jew and who doesn't. But I don't, I am not at all persuaded that necessarily the Jewish rules are the same as God's rules. But, but like my, my lineage doesn't go anywhere near Abraham's. I... I, I go back to Japheth and Noah and that's it, you know, and then Adam from that. So, you know, does that answer that question? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, so, so Romans says that by faith, we have become the children of Abraham. And that's probably the key text for the people that would say that the church is spiritual Israel. That's the verse that they would use. Um, but when you, when you, and you go read it, and I, I can't off the top of my head remember which chapter in Romans, but I, I could find it for you when church is over if you want. But um, the point that Romans is making, that, that the Apostle Paul by the Holy Spirit is making in Romans, is that um, the, the Jewish people were very preoccupied with trying to like keep the law. And he said, but the law is not the reason that the Jewish people are special. The reason the Jewish people are special is not because they got the Ten Commandments. The reason they're special is because of Abraham. And Abraham was not the friend of God and not special because he kept the law. It'd be hundreds of years until Moses was even born. Abraham was special because he believed God and it was counted to him to righteousness. So, so in Romans, what Paul is doing is he's saying, trying to go back to Moses is the wrong place to go back to. You want to go back and be the children of Abraham, and that's done by faith. Abraham did it by faith, not by the law like Moses. And so, because he's, tra he's trying to say that, like, because a lot of the Jewish people, when they're trying to share the gospel with them, were very hung up on, what do you mean grace? What do you mean God's given it to us for free? We don't, we don't like that, yeah. because Moses... And he was saying, no, no, not Moses. 
Abraham, because Abraham got it for free just by faith. And, and so it's not that God has changed. They're like, this is a very big change. God's been dealing with Moses like this, and now God's dealing like this. Like, what changed? And, and Paul in, in Romans is saying, it's not a change. It's back to the fundamentals. This is back to how it always was. Does that... So, so in that sense, in that sense, we're children of Abraham, we're the children of faith. And so Father Abraham, it, it confuses kids. It's not my favorite for that reason. But, that's, but that's, that's what it means, or that's what it's supposed to mean. Okay. Great, great questions. All right, it is 8.02. Let me, let me run through. Oh, yeah, go ahead, brother. What's driving this theology? What's the replacement theology? Yeah. Let me tell you what I think, <laughs> since you asked. The question is, what, what's driving replacement theology? Why do people do this? I believe that the earliest writings we find of it come from Constantine's era. And you can't run a government, you can't build a power or raise a military or taxes with what the New Testament has to say. Because it's love your neighbor, and if a man wants your coat, give him two, and, you know, they that swing the sword or perish by the sword and you just can't run a government that way. And so they wanted some Bible stuff to justify government power and control. And all those verses are in the Old Testament. <laughs> so they went, how do we grant, how do we use all these Old Testament verses to justify us as kings and rulers and emperors? And so they Somebody came up with the idea of, well, the church is spiritual Israel, and so we can use all that old text. I think that's how it came about. Maybe that's unkind or unfair to those people. I don't know. That's my theory. It doesn't show up in early Christian writings. It only shows up once Constantine makes Christianity legal. Because before then, they're just persecuted, and it's not relevant even. So that's my theory, is that, that it was a grab for power. Lots of corrupt theology, I think, starts out as a grab for power. People today aren't necessarily grabbing for power. They've bought into it, but I think that's how, you know, they believe it now, but I, but I think it started that way. Then is that question? Okay. I mean, it's speculation based on I've met people. <laughs> yes, sir. King, kingdom now is the same thing. They're, they're related. The differences between kingdom now. So he's, the question is about kingdom now theology. And versus dominion theology versus replacement theology, they are triplets. The, the differences between them are not great. I mean, they would argue with that, but from somebody on my side of the fence. <laughs> yeah. Well, replacement theology and, I mean, they, they, they broadly believe, most of them, that this is the millennium that the tribulation happened in 70 AD, you and I right now are living in the thousand year rule and reign of Christ and that his kingdom is, is unstoppably advancing. And this is it. You're, you're living in the millennium and have been for 2000 years. Math is hard. Don't worry about it. <laughs> and, and they, 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 they literally like big, big name theologians think that that's true, that this is, that this is the world being ruled by a rod of iron by Jesus Christ. But again, it's, it's, it's the, you know, it's the Catholic church primarily as a justification for like our kingdom is going to continually advance unstoppably, which is kind of what Jesus said, <laughs> but, but they mean it in a political and economic sense. And again, to justify any of that, you need the old Testament. And so they pull it in, but they say, yeah, this is the, it, it's kingdom. That's what kingdom now means is that the kingdom of God is now. Which, you know, the kingdom of God is in our hearts, but it's not, it's not out there. <laughs> it's the opposite out there. And, and, and again, the New Testament is emphatically clear about this, that evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse. You know, I mean, like the Bible is clear that things are going to get worse, not better. And the Bible is right. And those theologians are wrong. <laughs> if that were a pulpit made of wood, I'd bang it harder. Okay. Um, it's 806. If anyone's got to bleed out now, they can. Let me just do this just so we can put this, this um, handout to bed. Um, the outline. I, I want to say what I did about this. I've given you my interpretation basically already before we looked at the verses. And we don't have time to go through it very in much detail tonight. We never were going to. But um, I wrote this as neutrally as I could. Uh, I, I intentionally restrained myself as much as possible from putting 
what I think the application is in, in these verses. I'm sure it leaked in there in a few places. I could point out a couple of them. <laughs> but I, but I, I was as restrained as I could at this because I think this will be helpful. If you go study it, because I, listen, don't just believe your pastor. That was too enthusiastic of an amen. I'm teasing. <laughs> I was really hoping somebody would. So I could, uh, it was a trap and you walked into it. Thanks, sister. Um, no, don't just believe what your pastor says. Don't. Like, don't. Believe this book. Somebody just say amen. This is, this is the one. And, and, and what, I would like more, what I would like more than anything else is for, if you, after this, and I've given you some groundwork, and you kind of know what I think a little bit, and that's fine, but you go look at this. And this outline, I think, that I want to run through very quickly will help you as you go read it. And, and I think that, like me, if you read this, just try to straightforward take what Christ said, especially you look at it in context, that you're going to go and you consider how this lines up with what Revelation says and how it lines up with what Daniel says, that the most straightforward reading is this is talking about what's going to happen to Israel in the tribulation, you know, um, not what's going to happen to Christians. Um, but you might come up with something different, and that's okay. I would like to code to your bunker, please. Um, but, but, but I don't. But here's how, here's how it goes. This is how Christ's teaching goes. So it starts out with, he's rejected. I mean, chapter 23, he's rejected. The woes on the Pharisees, blindness on Israel. I would have gathered you, but you would not. You will not see me again until you say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Verse one of Matthew 24 then says, the temple is going to be destroyed. <laughs> Which is one of the reasons the allegoricists say, well, that happened in 70 AD, but you, you go read it and see what you think. It's clearly a future destruction of the temple that, that's coming in verses 1 and 2. Then um, the next section of it is in, starts in verse 3. The disciples ask Jesus two questions. When will these things be? Specifically, they're asking, now understand, they're asking about the destruction of the temple. Jesus says they're not going to leave a brick on top of another. And he say, when? And the second question is, what will the sign be of your coming? When are you coming back? What's the sign for it? And the end of the age. Which they connect his second coming with the end of the age in their question. Correctly, I believe. Jesus begins in verses 4 through 8 to talk about what the non-signs are. The things that are not the signs. Deceptions of false Christs, wars, famines, pestilences, earthquakes. Jesus says you're going to see all these things and the end is not yet. And guess what? That's the history of our world, isn't it? So people are like, oh man, there's a war. It's a sign of the end. <laughs> like, no, it's not. <laughs> because those things are non-signs, right? Then in verse 4, Jesus answers with the increasingly close signs. If you look at it, he does a very interesting thing in verses 9 through 26. He starts, there's like an amplification of it that indicates that it is close. So if these things are going to happen, and the end is not yet. But when it escalates, that's a sign that it's close. Does that sort of make sense? You go read it. Heavy persecution, more false prophets. It says those that will hold out to the end will be saved. Again, that's a problem if you've confused Israel and the church, but saved here in the context of Israel means survive. The universal preaching of the gospel right before the end, which that project is underway now. The abomination of desolations. The Bible, so Jesus talks about that, verse 15, 16, and 20 again. This lines up really precisely with what the prophet Daniel says. And so this gives us one of our markers. When you look at what Revelation says and what Daniel says, now we can kind of line that timeline up with what Jesus is talking about. That's sort of the key to lining it up. Then the abomination the desolation kicks off what Jesus calls the great tribulation, where there's even more deception, false prophets, false Christ, false signs. Right, that's Jesus' teaching on it. Then in verse 27, Jesus gives the sign. <laughs> he gives the sign of his coming and the end. And he says that it will be obvious like lightning. So any of Jesus that you have to go see is not Jesus. Being in Australia will not stop you from seeing Jesus come. Right? It's, I'm just saying, like, it's, it's coming and every eye is going to see, Jesus said. Um, disturbance in heavenly bodies, the sun, the moon are dark, and the powers of heaven are shaken, stars fall. See, the sign is this, the sign of the Son of Man coming in the clouds. Now, this is, a, a lot of people, can, I believe, <laughs> confuse this with the rapture. They say, well, they, here's the Son of Man coming in the clouds. It's the sign of the end. But this is the end. You go read it. This is the end. The abomination of desolation has happened. Jesus is coming back. This is 
this is the end. And so if you take that position, the rapture happens, we come up and we come straight back down with Jesus. That's, and that, that's a very difficult position to sustain for many, many reasons. Talked about a lot of them last Wednesday night. It violates a lot of promises. Um, and then, but so Jesus says, okay, so it's the sign. Everybody sees him, which again is different from the way the Bible just talks about the rapture because everybody in the whole world sees him. The whole people of all the earth mourn when they see the son of man coming in the clouds and the angels are sent to gather the elect through all the earth. That's one of the reasons people think, well, is that the rapture? Because he's gathering the elect from all the earth. Again, I, I, in context, this is, this is the Jewish people that they're, they're all gathered together because the, the Christ is coming back the end is here, this is it. And so the elect here are not Christians. The elect are, so the shows it's the elect people. It's the, it's the people of God. And that's not clear in the text unless you by context say, who is this talking to? Does that make sense? Okay. But again, if you say, well, that's not the Jews, that's Christians, you have a, you have a worse problem <laughs> of why does this not happen? Why have we gone through the abomination of desolations and the triumph of the Antichrist over the saints? We've endured the wrath of God poured out onto the whole earth and we've gone through all the wrath of God that God said we wouldn't go through. I mean, it's a much worse problem to have, I, I would argue. And then Jesus in, in uh, chapter 24, beginning in verse 32, all the way through chapter 25, verse 30, Jesus begins to answer the when question. And this is fascinating. It goes through a series of parables and teachings that Jesus does. It's all part of the same sermon. Uh, and I love this, and, and we'll end here because it's 8.13. But um, the parable of the fig tree. <laughs> so here's the fascinating thing. Because people say, well, no one knows the day or the hour of Christ's return. And that's true. The Bible says that emphatically clearly. But Jesus' own teaching. The disciples say, when will it be? And Jesus says, well, it's like a tree getting ripe. And you can tell that it's getting ripe. And it's getting riper and riper and riper. And Jesus says, if you can judge that the tree's almost ready, why can't you be able to judge when the coming of the Son of Man is going to be, right? And so no one's going to know the day or the hour, but the basic time period of the second coming is a knowable thing. People are going to be able to base it. When the abomination of desolation happens, mark your calendars, three and a half years later, right? And we might not know the day or the hour, but that's the second coming. And Jesus says, and here are all these things that are going to precede it. It's going to go like this and worse and worse and worse. And part of the reason they get a ticking clock is because it's so bad, Jesus says, that if the days were any longer, nobody would survive. And so the, the calendar is given to give those, those poor people some hope that you only got to make it three and a half years. You know, and if you can do that, then Jesus is coming. Maybe not the day or the hour, but you know when it's going to happen. But this is, in contrast to, this is in contrast to a lot of the teachings in the New Testament that you and I, we ought to be expecting Christ's return at any moment. That at any moment, we should expect Jesus to come back. But I'll tell you this. Is the temple rebuilt? Then the second coming can't happen. Has the abomination of desolations happened? Then the second coming can't happen. There's things that Jesus lays out that are going to precede the second coming that have not happened there's no reason to expect the second coming to occur at any moment. It can't happen yet. There's things that have to happen first. That makes sense? Which is another reason why you have to separate the rapture from the second coming because the rapture is supposed to be, we're supposed to be ready at any moment. Not, well, if I see the abomination of desolations, then I'll get ready. Does that sort of make sense? Which is, again, that's a problem with putting the rapture right at the very end because now we know when the rapture is going to happen too. There are signs for it rather than it being an instant, unexpectable, unexpected event. Okay. And then finally, and I just say this because this throws a lot of people, the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons, the cults love this um, because it confuses people. Um, but it's the judgment of the Gentiles that it occurs immediately after the second coming. It's the separating of the sheep and the goats. Um, and it's based on works. It's based on works. You go read it. Go see what Jesus says. It's based on works. Who goes on this side? Who goes on that side? People on this side, everlasting fire. People on this side, enter into the kingdom. So if this, is, if this is talking to Christians, that is exactly the opposite of what the Bible teaches everywhere else. But if it's talking to Israel, and if it's talking to what's going to happen, who gets to go into the millennial reign, the church is already gone. This is not talking to Christians anymore. Now it's, now it's talking about like, did you take the mark of the beast? 
Did you worship his image? Did you turn in the Jews? Or did you try to help them and feed them? That, that determines who gets to go into the millennial reign and who doesn't. Does that sort of make sense? Now, you go read it all. That's that outline. Like I said, that's as neutral as it could be. But and I, as we've hit that along, I've given you some defense of why I think, what I think about it. Um, but I hope it's helpful. Um, it's 817. You got a question up in the top there? Part three next week. Part three next week? Yeah. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to get back to the original handout. Um, so like what's up next is what are the key events prophesied for the great tribulation? I'm excited to talk about that. When God starts opening the seals and the trumpets, again, I'm excited because I think I'm not going to be here. But, but if we are, then we should know what's coming. Amen. <laughs> um, email me, text me, grab me here after church. I would love to answer more questions. Um, I am not sorry. I don't know. Um, I, I, it is a little bit late, but you guys got me all spun up. Watch me blame you for it. Okay. Uh, let me pray just so people that are, that have places to go bedtime that we can get you out of here. If you've got more questions, I'd love to stay and talk to you a little bit more about it. Or like I said, text me or email me. Um, let's pray. God, we just thank you, Lord, for tonight. Thank you for these people. And God, just thank you for the fact that um, you're coming back. And Lord, the, the details are interesting and fascinating, and we're glad to have them. And as we get closer, many of these things uh, become clearer. We start to get a sharper read, Lord, we think on, on what's coming. But the big exciting one is that you're coming. And um, we need you. God, thank you for being with us. But boy, we look forward to that day when you sit on your throne and you set things right. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be encouraged, that you'd help us to encourage one another, that you'd help us to be bright lights. There's a lot of people out there that don't know you and need to. And God, we pray that you'd make us diligent, busy about your business in that way. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.